Rome's wars against the empires of ancient Persia began almost immediately after the two civilizations came into direct contact and would continue for half a millennium after. The 1st century BC was a time during which the newly reformed Roman legions reigned supreme on the battlefield, suffering only a few defeats. However, in 53 BC, the Romans met a completely new army at the Battle of Carre. In the aftermath of the Diadochi Wars, Seleucus's new empire reigned over the vast Asian territories of the former Achaemenid Empire. Among those were the regions of Bactria and Parthia, which quickly sought to assert their own autonomy and revolted in 247 BC. During this time, Parthia was receiving wave after wave of nomadic migration from Central Asia, so in the same year one of these tribal leaders, Arsaces of the Pani tribe, managed to depose the rebellious governor, Andragoras, and occupied the region for himself. This marked the beginning of the Arsacid dynasty in Parthia. After achieving a tentative peace with the newly independent Bactrian kings and weathering a series of attempted reconquests by Seleucus II and Antiochus III, the Parthians began to gradually increase their territory at the expense of the waning Seleucids. This process accelerated during the reign of Mithridates I. Ruling from 171 to 132 BC, Mithridates oversaw the transformation of the Parthian state into a mighty empire. He embarked on a series of conquests, first seizing parts of Bactria upon the death of Diodotus II during the 150s. Media, Atropatene and parts of Mesopotamia soon followed. Most critical was the annexation of Seleucia and Babylon, where the Parthian ruler was first crowned King of Kings, symbolically inheriting the ancient Achaemenid title. Upon Mithridates' death, a number of crises began at once. Nomadic invasions from the east, internal strife, and a resurgent Seleucid rump state. However, Mithridates II ascended to the throne in 124 BC and managed to stabilize the rising empire. Whilst reconquering lost territories, this king also established firm trading relations with the Han Chinese and gained suzerainty over the Kingdom of Armenia. By his death in 87 BC, Mesopotamia was firmly under Parthian control, with a new capital city known as Tesiphon. This good fortune did not last long, and when Mithridates perished, a period of civil strife began. Seeing his western and eastern rivals weakened like this, the king of Armenia, Tigranes, broke his vassalage with Parthia and invaded both the Parthian realm and the Seleucid remnant. Northern Mesopotamia fell to the Armenians, and the once great Seleucid Empire was finally extinguished forever. When Roman armies ended this threat at the Battle of Tigranocerta, their success led to Roman and Parthian borders meeting for the first time. Parthian king Sinotruches declined the attempts of Mithridates of Pontus to form an anti-Roman alliance. This policy of non-intervention continued during the reign of his son, Phraates III, who also refused Roman requests to support their campaigns against Pontus. Nevertheless, informal arrangements between Rome and Parthia led to the drawing of a border between the two sides at the Euphrates River. With the Pontic Kingdom and its Armenian allies subjugated, it was clear that the Roman-Parthian interactions would inevitably lead to border conflicts. With the context for future antagonism between the two empires established, we must now turn to Rome. After the horrors of Sulla's civil wars, Roman politics were dominated in the 50s by three statesmen, Pompey, Crassus and Caesar. 59 BC saw the Duumvirate succeed in backing Caesar's bid for the consulship. He managed to dominate his co-consul during the year and accomplished what his partners needed of him, receiving a command in Gaul as a proconsul. Three years later, prompted by Caesar, the three men met at Lucca in order to organize what would become the first triumvirate. They had a bill passed through the Senate, essentially partitioning the Roman state between them. Caesar was given a five-year extension to his command in Gaul in order to complete the conquest, while Pompey received two Spanish provinces, which he was permitted to govern in absentia. 
Finally, and most importantly for us, Crassus was granted the province of Syria and legal authority to raise seven legions. In addition, he also had the power to make war and peace without consulting the Roman Senate, a fact which would set the stage for the war to come. Ever since the borders of Rome and Parthia met, tensions between the two had predictably skyrocketed, but both states knew that ultimately Rome was nominally more powerful. With this in mind, it is crucial that we detail events within Parthia which led up to the clash. In 57 BC, the weak Parthian king Phraates III was murdered by two of his sons, igniting a period of unrest within the country. The elder of the two, yet another Mithridates, quickly took the throne as Mithridates III. This was not to last long, as he was even more swiftly dethroned by a group of nobles led by the aristocratic Serena clan, who subsequently installed the younger brother Orides on the throne. Instead of being executed, Mithridates was relegated to being governor of Media. This proved to be an unwise move, however, because he soon contacted the Romans to gain assistance in restoring him to the throne. He fled west into the arms of his would-be benefactors, but was then sent back into the Parthian capital to undermine the monarchy's stability. Another Parthian civil war had begun, and Rome hungrily eyed the rich eastern territories, looking to absorb them like it had so many others. This fractious situation is the state in which Crassus found the Roman East when he received the Syrian command, and the way was clear for him to gain Alexander-like military glory by subduing the apparently weak enemy. Small-scale Roman military activity in the region prior to Crassus's arrival in Antioch had alerted the Parthians to what was soon to come, and they set about preparing for it accordingly. Full mobilization of their armed forces was undertaken as they waited for Rome to make the first move. When they did, the Parthian forces would shift and counter it. By mid-54 BC, everything was prepared and the legions were ready. The key question Crassus now had to answer was what route his army would take on their march. He could either invade from Syria and into western Mesopotamia directly, or take an indirect path through the Armenian mountains and move into Parthia from the north. Crassus chose the first route, probably due to it being the most direct and easier to traverse than the alternative. The Romans then crossed the Euphrates, marking the start of the first Romano-Parthian War. Soon after the war began, Crassus met the local satrap Syllaces in battle, decisively defeating his vastly outnumbered forces near Icne. With his troops scattered, Syllaces fled wounded to the court in order to inform King Orides. With the region's local forces trampled beneath the legionary boot, Crassus garrisoned the region's key towns such as Icne, Nicephorium, and Carre. Almost all of the Greek cities went over to the Romans voluntarily, with one exception. The city of Xenodotium invited a Roman force into the city, but then had them massacred. Naturally, this brought the Republic's wrath down upon the city, and it was soon viciously sacked. With his gains secured, Crassus withdrew his army back to Syria for the winter, the campaign of 54 having been a total success. Having raised two armies, the Parthians also campaigned during 54. Orides II possessed the bulk of Parthia's armies in Media, while his leading noblemen raised a second force from their own estates. The plan was for Orides to knock Armenia out of the war, while the aristocratic forces would play a sacrificial role in buying the king time. The commander of the secondary army is known to us as Surinus, a name which refers to that of his noble family rather than his given name, which we do not know. According to Plutarch, this man was the foremost Parthian of his time, having no equal in stature, talent and personal beauty. The Surina clan also supposedly possessed the authority to place the crown on the heads of Parthian kings, indicating their royal importance. Surinus quickly raised a formidable army and marched with it into southern Mesopotamia, where the rebel Mithridates was fortified. The Parthian commander assaulted Seleucia, capturing it in short order, before capturing Mithridates and sending him to Orides. 
he was executed not long after, while the key Mesopotamian cities of Babylon and Ctesiphon also fell to Cyrenus. So, while Rome was making gains in 54 BC, the Parthians were doing the same. Back in Syria, the Roman commander's relatively inexperienced army was also short of cavalry, as the contingent from Rome's client of Armenia had not arrived. The situation was alleviated somewhat when Crassus's son, Publius, arrived to reinforce his father with 1,000 Gallic horsemen. These troops had been loaned by Caesar, with whom Publius had been serving with distinction for years. 54 BC's campaigning ended with the Romans on the front foot, but with plenty of reason to be cautious. A Parthian ambassador was sent to speak with Crassus before the campaigns of 53, proclaiming that the king would generously allow him to retreat. This envoy laughed dismissively upon the Romans' insistence that he would give the Parthian envoy a reply in the Parthian capital of Seleucia. In response, the envoy held out the palm of his hand to Crassus, scornfully stating, O oh Crassus, hair will grow here before you see Seleucia. After crossing the Euphrates at Zugma, Crassus decided against marching towards the Mesopotamian cities, and instead marched east in May. He knew that his scouts had spotted Parthian forces in the region, and wanted to defeat them in the field. As Rome's legions approached the river Belic, scouts blundered into Cyrenus' army and were brushed back, suffering many casualties. Nevertheless, they managed to inform Crassus, who decided it was time to fight. He ordered his troops to freshen up, eat a quick meal, and march. That afternoon, the two armies finally found one another on the plains near Carre. The Roman army lining up for battle at Carre comprised of seven legions at its core, totaling roughly 34,000 legionaries. Accompanying this significant force were 4,000 native auxilia and 4,000 light cavalry, 1,000 of which were the Gauls brought from Caesar by Publius. Their Parthian enemy was a completely alien force from a totally different military tradition. Cyrenus brought no infantry at all to the battlefield, constructing his army as a direct counter to Roman strengths in close quarters. To this end, 9,000 horse archers armed with short compound bows made up the majority of his army, while 1,000 heavily armoured cataphracts equipped with heavy lances formed the flower of Parthia's nobility and freemen. As the Romans caught sight of their adversary, they would have seen a numerically weak force, barely armoured at all. This was yet another ingenious ploy by Cyrenus, who had cleverly concealed his numbers by hiding the depth of his army behind the width of an advance guard. In addition, he had ordered the army's cataphracts to wear robes above their armour, so that any observer would see them as just regular cavalrymen rather than the truly lethal heavy knights that they were. Encouraged into battle by his son, Crassus marched to meet Cyrenus' army in battle, thoroughly unaware of the danger he truly faced from the utterly prepared Parthian army. At first, Crassus arrayed his troops in a long extended line with cavalry on each wing to prevent encirclement. However, he changed his mind at the last minute and reformed his forces into a square formation before advancing, probably in an attempt to give the Roman army strength on all sides. Now, to the terrifying battle roar of Parthian drums and bronze bells, Cyrenus led a full-scale cavalry charge against the Roman square, with cataphracts in front and horse archers behind. As they did so, the Parthian general gave the order for his cataphracts to cast away their concealing robes, simultaneously revealing their true nature in an attempt to damage the morale of the enemy. Unaffected, and with their typical iron discipline, the Romans locked their shields and braced for the charge. However, just before the impact, Cyrenus's cavalry peeled around the sides of Crassus's square, quickly encircling it with a swarm of highly mobile horse archers while the cataphracts pulled back and regrouped. A short-lived attempt by the Roman light troops to break the flanking maneuver was immediately met with a storm of arrows, forcing them back into the square. With their enemy pinned, the mounted archers began unleashing a barrage of arrows upon the Roman square from all sides. 
used to dealing with arrow fire, the legions employed their famous testudo, confident that their heavy armor and shields could weather the storm. However, it quickly became clear that the unfamiliar barbed arrows used by the Parthians, as well as their powerful compound bows, were shockingly capable of penetrating Roman protection. As the horse archers loosed volley after volley into the enemy square, the Romans began to suffer losses. Even as this went on, Crassus must have felt hopeful despite the rain of missiles. Once the horse archers emptied their quivers, he must have thought, the enemy horsemen would have to attack him close up or withdraw. The triumvirate was in for a nasty surprise. Cyrenus now revealed the most cunning part of his plan. A mobile rearming train of 1,000 camels carrying vast stores of arrows was sent out behind the Parthian cavalry. So long as the mounted archers resupplied at different times, and so long as the camels were evenly spaced, the barrage would continue indefinitely. If Crassus, having realized what was happening, did not make a move now, the Romans would be killed where they stood. With a mixed force of 4,000 cavalry and legionaries, Publius was ordered to lead a breakout. His contingent charged out of the square, causing the Parthian horsemen in front of it to retreat almost immediately. Not wanting to lose the momentum his surprise attack had gained, Publius pushed further, right into Cyrenus's counter-trap. As his retreating foe withdrew, they shifted in the direction of their regrouped reserve of cataphracts, which now charged with their lances. The maneuverable mounted archers now turned on their pursuers. The impact was devastating. As Cyrenus's elite heavy cavalry engaged the lightly equipped Roman horsemen, the resurgent horse archers fired into their flank and into the mass of encumbered legionaries. It was all too much for the outgunned Romans, and they fled defeated to a nearby hill and locked their shields, ready to make a gallant last stand. Publius, determined not to desert his command, ordered one of his soldiers to kill him. All resistance on the hill now collapsed and a final thunderous charge by the Parthian cataphracts at last destroyed this isolated unit. Back at the main force, Crassus had a decision to make. He could either retreat and leave his son to certain death, or advance, risk his whole army and hope to save him. He chose the latter. They had not gotten far when a cloud of dust and the beating of war drums drew Roman attention, followed by the head of Publius mounted on a lance. At this horrifying sight, Roman morale finally broke. Cyrenus employed his favorite tactic again. The cataphracts charged, the Romans tightened their formation, and then the horse archers encircled, showering the square with arrows once again, slowly bleeding the army to death until dusk ended the assault. At nightfall, the Parthians withdrew and camped nearby, leaving a devastated army behind it. Only 20,000 of the original 42,000 Roman troops remained to fight, but many were injured. Crassus was immobilized with grief and loss, so the two surviving senior officers, Cassius and Octavius, led the survivors in retreat to the town of Carre. The men who were too wounded to walk were ruthlessly left behind. During the march, panic would periodically take hold and the Romans would form up for battle before settling down again. Eventually, they reached Carre and were brought inside the city, still counting around 15,000 men. When dawn broke, the Parthians slaughtered the 4,000 injured men who had been left behind and continued on to find Crassus. Cyrenus would not let him escape, but he did not know where he was. Eventually figuring out he was in Carre, Cyrenus went there but realized Crassus had fled into the hills. He was subsequently found and ignominiously killed by Parthian soldiers after being tricked into faux peace negotiations. The death of the Triumvir and the destruction of his army destabilized the political situation in Rome, leading to an eventual fracture between Pompey and Caesar. The only section of Crassus's army to return safely to Syria was that led by one Gaius Cassius Longinus, the man who would eventually conspire against Caesar in 44 BC. Cyrenus had inflicted the worst defeat on the Romans in 150 years. As an appropriate reward for this great service, 
Orodes II had him put to death for treason. Though Parthia had gained victory in the first war between them and Rome, conflicts between the two states would last for centuries to come. New videos on Roman and Iranian histories are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.